Our scripture reading <clears throat> is, comes from Exodus chapter 3. I don't believe I've ever preached a sermon out of Exodus before, actually, which is ironic considering I named my firstborn son after Moses. Exodus chapter 3, we'll be reading verses uh, 1 through 5. <clears throat> Exodus 3. This is the word of the Lord. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you, are, where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And Moses said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with, with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Praise be to God for his word. God, may you speak to us through the reading and preaching of your word, and may the name of Christ ever be praised. Amen. Many years ago, a seven-year-old Mark Haynes spotted Roger Moore at the Nice airport in France. Uh, Roger Moore was always one of my favorite James Bonds. Uh, actually, he was in one of the James Bond movies that was where James Bond goes to New Orleans and fights, you know, the massive criminal mafia down in New Orleans. Uh, but Mark Haynes, at seven years old, spotted Roger Moore in an airport in France. And he got an autograph note on the back of his airplane ticket with 
best wishes. But as Marx studied the, uh, the signature, the autograph, he discovered a problem. This seven-year-old saw that he did not sign it James Bond, rather it read Roger Moore. Seven-year-old Mark Haynes didn't know who Roger Moore was, but he knew who James Bond was. So he told his granddad, who was completely oblivious to who James Bond even is, and his granddad walked back to Roger Moore and he heard his granddad say, he says you've signed the wrong name. He says your name is James Bond. So Roger Moore, with a smile on his face, called Mark over, and Moore leaned over in his airport chair. He looked from side to side. He raised an eyebrow, and in a hushed voice he said, I have to sign my name as Roger Moore, because otherwise Blofeld might find out I was here. <laughs> Mark Haynes was delighted by this encounter by this experience, and he grew up to enter the film business like his hero. You see, it was one encounter that changed Mark's entire life. And if this is true of an encounter with Roger Moore, what effect does an encounter with God have on us? Today, we'll ask what Moses' encounter with the Lord teaches us. What can we learn about ourselves and about who God is? So we'll ask and answer three questions today, and we'll begin with, what does this encounter with God teach us about our circumstance? First, God's timing is usually not ours. God's timing is usually not ours. I got this point from uh, Timothy Keller. Uh, the Lord was about to use Moses as an instrument to deliver his people. Now, if I were writing a screenplay for a movie about Moses and about him being an instrument to deliver his people. Moses would have became the superhero, the great deliverer of the Israelites immediately after he slayed that Egyptian guard who was beating the Hebrew slave. Right, at that point, Moses would have killed the guard, and he would have gathered his people, and he would have victoriously led them out. But that wasn't the Lord's timing. The Lord gives this divine delay, which are blessings. What good could come from delaying Moses and allowing him to go through 40 years of lowliness after slaying this guard? Moses, if you remember, he fled to Midian where he would then shepherd a flock. Shepherding was very dirty work and would have been to an Egyptian the lowest of blue-collar work. Moses was raised as an Egyptian. And you can try to see what the Lord is doing here, right? He formed Moses for 40 years in the riches of Egypt. And then 40 years, 40 humble years in Midian. God was using both of these experiences, right? Both good and plenty and riches and difficult. Humility, seeing his need to create the sort of man that Moses was to become. These divine delays in Moses' life created a shepherd for God's people. And this is how it is in our lives too, isn't it? We find ourselves in strange or grueling circumstances that we'd rather not be in. We don't have God's bird's eye view of our lives nor know his plans, but he has a purpose. If we knew everything God knew, then maybe we would feel differently. Thus, his timing is hardly ever our timing. But how many times can you look back on the circumstances in your lives, including the, the most difficult ones, and then see God's providential hand in it and see that his timing was impeccable? How does an encounter with God teach us about our circumstance, or what does it teach us? Second, often the Lord uses these circumstances to show how useless we are in our own strength, right? 40 years in Egypt, and Moses thought he was really something. He had the finest education and the finest nation at the time. No wonder why he used his own brute force to strike down an enemy. 
Yet he then spends 40 years as a lowly shepherd. He doesn't even own his own flock. Scripture tells us right in the first verse that Moses is tending not his flock, but his father-in-law's flock. God humbled Moses. He goes from, I'll do this myself with my own hands, to a meek man who says, Lord, don't send me. I can't even speak right. It took years of exaltation and humiliation. And then in one encounter with God, Moses saw his place in the world. I was just having lunch with someone just last week, and he asked me about the Lord's timing. He asked, well, if, if God knew he was going to call me to himself, then why did I have to go through all these years of rebellion and suffering, my own foolish mistakes, wandering away from him? Why didn't he just bring me to him right away? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know the Lord's plan for each of his people. Why didn't he bring Moses to himself right away? Why did he give Moses 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in lowly Midian, and then appear as a burning bush to him. Well, part of that plan was at least to create in Moses the sort of humility that the Lord wanted from his servant. He wanted Moses to know that without the Lord, he's nothing. Uh, Timothy Keller once said, you're never of any use to God until you feel absolutely useless in general. He says, you're never of any use to God until you have come to the end of yourself. Moses was brought to the end of himself to see his sinfulness and his finite limitations and to know the goodness and the strength of his God. And this leads me to ask a second question. What does this encounter with God teach us about our God? Moses, being a shepherd for 40 years in Midian, he would have known how to live in the desert. Deserts are hot, but at night they can become rather cold. And the shepherds, what they would do is they would actually burn bushes to keep warm. So Moses would have seen a burning bush, but no other shepherds. That would have caught his attention. But the other odd thing is that these bushes would, would quickly burn up, and then the shepherds would have to light another one and another one. And another one, right? But this one burned on and on. And as God so often does, he uses our circumstances to grab our attention and thus bring us closer to himself. His appearance as a burning bush attracts Moses' curiosity. And Moses walks closer. And as he approaches, God speaks. That's the first thing we should note. First, God is not silent. How do you know anything about God at all? Well, he reveals himself, right? He's spoken in his word. God is a God who speaks and makes himself known. And if he didn't do this, we wouldn't know anything about God at all. But he does something amazing here for Moses. He doesn't just speak. He appears. What we call a theophany, an appearance of God. He appears as a burning bush, or rather, I should say, it's actually an unburning bush. He appeared, he spoke, he drew Moses to himself. This tells us that God is not far off. He's not distant. He's not dispassionate. He speaks. He makes himself known. Second, God is self-defining and self-existent. God gave Moses his name. I am who I am, or Yahweh. If you read from the ESV translation, whenever you see the word Lord, and it's in all caps, it's using that very name. It's his covenantal name. And to be honest with you, that name deserves its own sermon. It deserves its own sermon series. But I'm not going to do that today. This name tells us God determines. And he announces who he is and what he's like. It's not up for us to, to speculate he determines who he is, and he reveals himself. And also, God doesn't say, I'm, I'm like this, or I'm like that. He doesn't say, I am good, or I am whatever. That's referential. God is not like other things. Other things imitate him. He's the original. He is who he is. Self-referential. 
He's powerful. God needs nothing. He depends on nothing. R.C. Sproul said that God is eternal. He always was or is. He has within himself the power of being. He requires no assistance from the outside, from outside sources to continue to exist. He's self-existent. Third, God is holy. Uh, God is often pictured throughout Scripture as a fire. Think about that. Fire commands respect. Fire commands reverence. There's a reason we teach our children not to play with fire, right? Either they'll get burned or they'll burn your house down. And as Moses approaches the Lord, he's warned, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. This teaches us something about God. We have to be careful how we approach God. He gets to tell us how we are to relate to him. We don't get to come to the Lord on our own terms. The Lord reveals how we are to have a relationship with him. Uh, Kelsey had a friend she occasionally met with uh, who was a mother uh, whose husband had actually ended his own life. And he, he appeared, or she appeared rather, to be searching for something. And she would meet with Kelsey. And at one of their lunches, she criticized Christianity and she called it weird. And Kelsey asked her, well, what about the Christian faith was weird? And what did her friend bring up? She brought up the burning bush and asked, well, what was that about? <laughs> right? The burning bush, that's pretty weird. But think about this. Fire, which represents God and his holiness, is presented in this appearance of God. And where is the fire? The fire is in and with the bush. Why would the Lord appear as an unburning bush? What is God telling us about himself? It represents God dwelling in and with his people. This demonstrates that, that God is not dependent on anything. The fire isn't consuming the bush for fuel. But it also demonstrates that God will find a way to dwell with us, never to leave nor forsake us, without his holiness consuming us. Kelsey's friend thought this was weird. But the Lord was showing us in the unburning bush that he will one day dwell with us, his people, without destroying us. He will make a way. God has made a way for his presence to, to dwell within us, to dwell with us, for us to, to come to him and worship without consuming us. Fire burns, fire consumes, yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were thrown into the fire and not consumed. They even smell like smoke, right? God is self-existent, he's self-defining, and he is holy. And he is relational, speaking to us and making himself known. He desires a relationship with his people, and he will provide a way to love us without his holiness burning us. And this leads us to our last question. What does this encounter with God teach us about our hope? What does this teach us about our hope? First, God sees... He hears and he knows. God sees, he hears, and he knows. Look at verse 7. It says, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them. He has eyes on us. He knows our sufferings. He knows our afflictions. He knows our circumstances. And he hears our cries for help. We are never alone in our suffering. And when the Lord says, I know they're suffering, you got to understand how game-changing this was at Moses' time. 
during the time of all these pagan religions when the gods were far off. You'd have to manipulate the gods through sacrifice and further suffering. Sometimes they would offer their children in sacrifice, their infants, to manipulate the gods. But to know in Hebrews, in the Hebrew language, to say you know, yada, it's more than just knowledge of the mind. It conveys deep, personal, intimate knowledge and loving concern for us. God sees the injustices that we all experience. And he hates them. He hates the injustice and the suffering that we experience. Uh, William Edgar, who was one of my professors at seminary, is a theologian, an apologist, and a, a jazz musician. He wrote, to be known by God is to be loved, to be in the best place you could possibly be. This is because God now bears the burden, not the people. Knowledge here means full acknowledgement and commitment to intervene. What else does this encounter with God teach us about our hope? Second, God is a God who delivers. He delivers. He says, I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them. There are two important verbs here. Come down and deliver. Uh, in Hebrew, come down is actually one word. But to come down, to, to intervene in human affairs is used in other places of Scripture, right? The most obvious one is the Tower of Babel, right, where the Lord comes down. But although God is high and holy and lifted up, he's not too distant to roll up his sleeves and to enter our troubles. God cares for us and will deliver us. Yahweh says he will deliver. And the other thing in Hebrew is that this word deliver has the sense of to snatch away. Right? It actually has violent overtones. In other words, the Lord is, is telling Moses to tell his people, I know your sufferings. I've heard your cries. I see what they're doing, and I will rescue you and give them what they have coming. This is a God who cares. Lastly, what does this encounter with God teach us about our hope? That we can have a new relationship with the Lord. We can have a new relationship with the Lord. He tells Moses, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now there's two blessings here, at least two. One, God promises to be with us, to be with his people, and two, he promises that we will serve him. This promise, of course, is contained in the image of the, the unburning bush. A holy God is dwelling with sinful people without consuming them. Right? God with us, Emmanuel. But this promise, this other blessing, that you shall serve God, this word for serve, abad, means to be a slave of, to cultivate, or to Worship, to worship. And it's a key word in the book of Exodus. The Lord is delivering his people, in other words, from the Abad, from, the, from slavery, from the worship of Egypt to the worship of the Lord. Instead of worshiping idols in Egypt and worshiping the Pharaoh, he's going to deliver them to worship God on this mountain. Instead of being a slave to Pharaoh, you will be of service to the Lord. This is a picture of what God has done for us. Delivering us out of slavery to our sins to a new life in service of Christ and his kingdom. Paul says, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. You see, the unburning bush, it promised God would be with his people, a sinful people, without consuming them by his holiness. And we live in a relationship with the Lord through worship, in service to him. How does God dwell with sinful people? How are we delivered from our slavery to idols? 
The unburning bush is ultimately a portrait of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who would lead a greater exodus and he would deliver us from our sins. In fact, in the gospel according to John, Jesus actually uses this word in the original language that he's going to lead an exodus when referring to our salvation. See, that ultimately, God would come down like he did here in Egypt, but he would come down to Bethlehem. That he would leave his throne in the heavens like Moses left Egypt, and that he would come to this world to be the even greater shepherd to his flock. That God would draw us to encounter him, to to see our lives and circumstances, to all be used by him for our good. And that we would have an everlasting hope to be in God's presence forever. Going back to Mark Haynes, that seven-year-old boy, uh, he did enter the film business and he met his favorite 007, Roger Moore, one more time again. Uh, They worked together on a UNICEF project, and Roger Moore was, if you remember, was one of their ambassadors. And Mark said this of working with Roger, quote, he was completely lovely. I told him in passing the story of when I met him in the Nice airport. He was happy to hear it. And he had a chuckle and said, well, I don't remember that, but I'm glad you got to meet James Bond. Mark goes on and says, and then he did something so brilliant. After filming, he walked past me in the corridor, heading out to his car. He paused. He looked both ways. He raised an eyebrow and said in a hushed voice, of course I remember our meeting in Nice, in Nice, excuse me, but I didn't say anything in there. Because of those cameramen, any one of them could be working for Blofeld. (laughs) Mark Haynes said, quote, I was delighted at 30 as I had been at 7. What a man. What a tremendous man. No doubt, Roger Moore, he had charm. He was sweet. He did a lot of good work for UNICEF. He was a tremendous man. He influenced a lot of people. One encounter with Roger Moore changed Mark's life. But nothing, nothing compares to Jesus in an encounter with him and to receive the deliverance that he has given us in the Gospels. One encounter with Jesus will not just change your life, it will change your eternity. He'll deliver you from your sins. He will deliver you from the bondage of sin. The eternal God of the universe, he bestows his love on you, never to leave nor forsake you and to work into you the freedom that you have in the newness of a life in Christ to which you have been delivered. Brothers and sisters, what a tremendous hope. Let's pray. Our Lord and Savior Jesus, we praise you for the greater exodus that you have brought your people through, that you have brought us through the waters of death into newness of life, that you are the propitiation, the atonement for sin made on our behalf, that you deliver us from the bondage and slavery to our idols to be of great service to you and the kingdom. May we see our place in this world as the adopted children of God. May we see hope in our circumstances, no matter how rich or how in need we are, whether it's in times of plenty or times of suffering. May we see that you are Lord over all and that our eternity is safely in your hands because of the hope of the gospel. We praise you. Amen.